everyone. Welcome back to A Wild Approach. In this video, this is the part two of the front garden tour. In case you didn't see part one, you might want to go back and check that one out at some point, but you can watch these in any order. It really doesn't matter. But in this video, we're going to cover the archway bed. And when I say the archway bed, I mean pretty much the whole archway bed from the archway to the gate. And then I'm also going to cover the peninsula bed a little bit. The peninsula bed is connected to the archway bed near the gate, so on the east side, and it kind of goes toward the crepe myrtle bed. And in the middle of the peninsula is a Washington hawthorn tree, so you're going to see that later in this video. Now where we are right now is right next to the archway. And I recently seeded this area. I don't know if I talked about that on this channel, but I just took, I think it was two separate days, and I just grabbed my kneeling pad, grabbed my garden knife, came out here, and I pulled a ton of weeds out of here. This bed was extremely weedy, and the only things in here that I actually put here pretty much are the cone flowers that you're seeing right now, the more mature cone flowers, and then that little evergreen um, blue star juniper to the left of it. And of course the passion vine and the pot. That, and that's this specific section of the archway bed. And so I had a lot of work to do. I had to come out here, I had to just pull and pull and pull a ton of Bermuda grass out of here. I had to pull a ton of Creeping Charlie out of here, and it doesn't really ever get eradicated. Um, it's still there. You think you get it by the root, and I think I had talked about that in the last video, but you don't actually get it all. Even if you think you do, there's still more there. You just, you just can't get it all. Um, I know some people like to spray herbicide before they start the garden, but see... One thing is, I've been trying to do it without spraying that for years, and if I was going to do that, I should have done that in the beginning. So if you are going to spray an herbicide, which isn't necessarily bad, but I don't love it, but if you're going to do that, which is recommended by some native plant garden people, it's really better if you do it from the get-go. Like, if you're going to kill your lawn, it's better to just kill it back then and then start your garden from there but see at that time I didn't know that and I had actually used it in my raised bed to get rid of the Bermuda grass and I sprayed it more than once and it seemed to kill it but then just within a couple years it was back so just keep in mind that even if you spray herbicide more than once and you think you've thoroughly killed it that way it will knock it back pretty good for a couple years, I will say. But it, if you have a Bermuda lawn, it's going to find its way back into your beds if it has a way to get to it. And I have old concrete walkways. I have an old concrete driveway. So I have these little cracks, these little crevices that this Bermuda can find its little way through. And it can find its way... It, it will find its way, okay? That's the point. And so... My honest opinion is if you're going to do herbicide, you might as well just herbicide your entire lawn <laughs> all at once, which is not really practical where I am, because I am on a hill, and so that would be a lot of plant material I'd have to replace all at once, and it, because if you don't, you got erosion problems. So maybe it's better for other people, but for me, it just wasn't practical, it didn't work for me. It came right back. Now, again, it worked for a while, but it did come right back. So just keep that in mind. Bermuda is kind of a beast. It li Not kind of, it really is a beast. It has these roots that are like vines. And so they're, they snake and grow underneath the surface. So even when you pile, I'm talking deep, deep, deep mulch. I've done it. I've done cardboard with mulch on top. I've done just a bunch of mulch in a big mountain. It finds its way up through it. So there's going to be a struggle. But my favorite method dealing with Bermuda grass is to be patient. I know. It's hard. It's easier said than done. But my favorite method is patience. 
my philosophy now is I don't really try to remove a big section of Bermuda grass unless I have a plan. Okay. And the plan has to be pretty immediate. I need to have a plan for what am I going to replace this Bermuda grass with um, right away, like within days. Because if I don't seed something there or plant plugs or just something, or at least transplant something I already have in the garden from somewhere else to there, if I don't fill that space, the Bermuda will find that open space. They find anything sunny and they go to it. Now, Notice I said they find anything sunny. By the way, this is mist flower right here. Blue mist flower is coming up from the ground. I still have the, the stems up. I've been trying to leave as many stems up as possible for habitat and for bees and for chrysalises and all that. There's some bee balm and some ironweed. But anyway, back to the Bermuda situation. <laughs> it likes the sun. So the good news is if you have a shady garden, you're probably not going to have any Bermuda. You know, you'll see a lot of people in garden groups, garden groups complain that their grass is dying because they're of the trees in their yard. And I'm just like, be thankful because now you can plant a shade garden with native shade plants and you don't have to deal with that Bermuda. So I've noticed that blue mist flower is a great plant to help reduce the Bermuda if it's a good growing condition for the mist flower because... It gets just tall enough that the Bermuda struggles to snake its way up to the sunlight. Somehow it just works. And I think part of it is you saw the mist flower comes up kind of like a little mat in the spring. So it kind of uh, smothers the ground enough to where the Bermuda isn't just shooting up. But by the time the Bermuda wants to shoot up in the air, the mist flower has already flushed up and is very lush. You just saw some common milkweed. There's some orange milkweed, which was a very quick little clip. And then there's some bee balm. There's Carolina Cranes Bill growing around it, which was a volunteer. Love it. And then, of course, Creeping Charlie that I'm always pulling up and is an invasive weed. But I would rather have Creeping Charlie than Bermuda. <laughs> as, as invasive and annoying as Creeping Charlie is, Bermuda is worse, and it has to do with the root system. So, Creeping Charlie, the root system isn't really that annoying. I mean, it takes time to pull it out, but it's not that bad. Here is a tree. I think it's a uh, black walnut, but I'm not 100% sure. I have to dig some trees out of my garden beds every once in a while. That is something you need to keep in mind. If you have open garden beds, especially in the sun, but even in the shade, Certain trees are going to germinate, especially if you like to have empty space for seeds of your plants to germinate. And here's a tulip poplar tree, same thing. It's a volunteer tree. I'm going to have to remove it. I'd like to pot it up because it's a pretty nice little, nice little tree and it's a nice little size. I just likely can't plant this in my garden, so I might have to give it away. So <laughs> I have a lot of little trees I can probably give away for free in my garden. Um... And that's another thing I want to talk about. So if you are planning a native garden, keep in mind that it can take a couple years for your seeds to self-sow. Here's some more common milkweed. And in that time, over a few years, you're going to start to see trees volunteering in your garden beds. And if you have a really large property... This is going to be great for you because this is going to be free trees for you. As long as they're native to your area, then they're good to keep as, as long as they're in a good spot. So if they're too close to your house, you know, you don't want weak trees really close to your house, you know, that are going to drop branches. Um, just kind of check guidelines online. See what the best distance from your house would be for specific trees. And same thing with power lines. You don't want big trees right under a power line. If you're going to plant under a power line, you want them to be shrubs and really small trees. Um, red buds are usually pretty good for this. Dogwoods are usually pretty good for this. And then, of course, shrubs like the, the smaller viburnums and things like that. And so here's the peninsula bed. Now, I get a lot of Creeping Charlie in here. I get a lot of Bermuda in here. I get a lot of some that other grass that I haven't quite identified yet that's not native. Oh, and here's the hummingbird. Can you guys see it? Oh, it is so hard to see. It blends right in with the coral honeysuckle vine. 
The coral honeysuckle vine is their favorite in my garden, and they go wild for it. He's, he's on the other side of the vine in this footage, but you can't really see him. He's just right along the other side because we're on this side, and he wants to avoid us. They're a little bit skittish, but not skittish enough that they're not going to buzz right past your head <laughs> to, to fly toward the vine. This is a great native vine, coral honeysuckle. I have a whole video on it. You can check it out on my channel. Um, but I'm actually trying to propagate this right now. I put some little cuttings. I had to trim it back anyway. So I put some cuttings in some water. And then when I was done cutting it, I took it out to the backyard and popped them in some soil. I popped a couple in the soil up front too. So I hope at least one of them roots because I really want to plant this this vine in multiple areas of my garden. It's great for privacy because it leaves out pretty early. It, it leaves out earlier than most of my other uh, deciduous things. And it's technically semi-evergreen, but in my garden it's a little bit more deciduous. Because um, it, it mostly uh, loses its leaves, but it kind of holds on to a few of them. But it's not enough to be like considered, in my garden at least, a full evergreen. Here's, I think, an ironweed plant. And then I think there's either an aster or a coneflower next to it. And that might be Rudbeckia. I'm not sure. <laughs> Some of these seedlings look alike. And then sometimes they look alike. But then one's like hairier than the other. And that's the only way I know the difference or whatever. But it's funny. I have planted pinstamen in here. I've planted coneflower in here. Mountain mint. And, I, and obviously ironweed. Uh, which I forgot I even put in here. I don't know, it could have volunteered. And there's Rubina barnariensis seedlings all throughout here. So, we'll see how it goes. There should be some Lanceleaf Coreopsis in here. But here's some Rudbeckia. Yeah, the cutworms are probably going to get it. The cutworms, I know, they're, an, they're a, uh, a, a moth caterpillar. And there's a bee bomb. I know cutworms are a moth caterpillar, but they do kind of drive me crazy because they do just chase after my rudbeckia. I actually saw it the day I was pulling weeds right here. I saw it running towards the rudbeckia and I kept putting it in a different spot and it kept running back toward the rudbeckia and I'm like, probably gonna lose that plant soon. Um, and what they do is they cut your plant right at the ground level. And to be honest, I don't know, you know, for sure if that is always gonna kill it. Or if that plant will come back by the root. But I think in my case it killed mine. Because mine were very tiny seedlings. That I had just transplanted to the garden. And one of my native garden friends told me. That the best way to get around that. Is once you realize that plant is attractive to them. Keep it in your little greenhouse. Or you know off the ground. Um, somewhere protected where those cutworms can't find it. Uh, until they're a little bit bigger. So basically I just transplanted it to the garden too soon. And I don't have a greenhouse. So, um, But the cool thing is, is you can get a really small greenhouse for a fairly low price. And this is the little, uh, was it called Johnny Jump Ups? The little native tiny, tiny flowers. You, there's no flowers on it in this video, but really cute little flowers. They're field pansies, I think is what's called. And that last thing might be Ridgeron, but... I'm not 100% sure, and if you don't know what an erigeron is, it kind of looks like a daisy, and it's but it's native, and it kind of, I think it's related to asters or something like that, but it's you, you can tell the difference between it and asters. This is the Washington Hawthorne tree. I have it planted in the little bump out of the peninsula bed over here at the east end of the archway bed, and I got this footage because I think it just shows the tree shape better. It's really small right now. It's a little bit, ba it's a little bitty baby. But I'm excited about this tree because it's supposed to have a great wildlife value. And at the same time, it's got um, not only a beautiful fall color, but it has thorns, which will be good for any birds that want to nest. It can protect them from these cats that live in the neighborhood. And I just showed you some bee balm, the red one. And now this is a phlox. I need to pull this creeping Charlie out from around it because it's kind of smothering it a little bit. And then to the left of the phlox... I have um, mountain mint, and then behind the mountain mint, I have bee balm. So I got a lot of mint family things here, and then I have the phlox with it. So a lot of things are getting lush. A lot of things are flushing out and leafing out and looking beautiful. And of course, bee balm just smells amazing. And mountain mint too. 
Although Mountain Mint smells a little bit strong for me. But Mountain Mint is great for the pollinators. It is one of the best perennials for pollinators. Fun fact. So, um, also, one last thing I forgot to show. It's starting to get dark in this video, but I forgot to show the elderberry. It's just about to bloom, and I'm really, really excited. I have three elderberries, and this one is the one on the west end of the archway bed, and it's right off my patio. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I will see you in the next one, which will be part three of the front yard garden tour, because I'm going to have multiple parts, and I'm not sure what I'm going to feature in the next video, but we'll see. Bye, guys. I just added some new original paintings to the shop. Go to MacyLou.com to check out the new pieces. I also have prints available as well as different categories of products. I have a $12 and under section and a $25 and under section as well because I believe every human being deserves to have art in their home and to feel cozy and comfortable wherever they live. I also have a contact page where you can easily get in touch with me at your convenience for art commissions and business inquiries. Just put a quick subject line such as, hey, I'd like an art commission, and then in the message section, put in detail about what type of commission you are wanting. Also, feel free to use the contact form as a way to ask any questions you may have about the art or the shop. Thanks for all of your support, no matter what form it takes.